To be a Christian is not just to accept the validity of certain doctrinal truths, to recite an Apostles' Creed, to state the doctrines of the church. It's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. You need to come to Jesus and say, with all the intensity of your being, after what you did for me, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. Christ came. Christ came and became one of us. That's Let me tell you about a school teacher. Her name's, her name's Jean Thompson. It was the first day of school, and she said what teachers always say the first day of school. Boys and girls, I love you all the same. Sometimes teachers lie. Sometimes there are children they don't like. She really didn't like Teddy Stollard, and you wouldn't like him either. He was a singularly unattractive child. He sat slouched in his seat. He never paid attention. His clothes were musty. He never bathed often enough to get rid of an ugly odor. His hair was always uncut and uncared for. When she spoke to him, he always answered in monosyllables, yeah, no. When she marked Teddy's papers, she always got a perverse delight out of putting X's next to the wrong answers. And when she put the F at the top of the paper, she always did it with a flare. Vroom, vroom, vroom. She should have known better. Teachers have records. She had records. First grade, Teddy is a good boy. He shows promise and work and attitude, but poor home situation. Second grade. Teddy is a good student, but he is too serious for a second grader. His mother is terminally ill. His father shows no interest. Third grade. Teddy is becoming withdrawn and detached from the other children. He needs help. His mother died this year. She had records. She should have known. Christmas came. The children brought Christmas presents and piled them on the teacher's desk. They were all in brightly colored paper, except for Teddy's present. His was wrapped in brown paper and held together with scotch tape. But to tell the truth, she was surprised he even brought a present. When she tore open the brown paper, out fell a rhinestone bracelet with most of the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume that was almost empty. The children began to snicker and giggle at the presents, but she had enough sense to snap on the beat-up bracelet. Taking some perfume out of the almost empty bottle, she put it on her wrist and held it up and said, Isn't it lovely? Isn't it lovely? Taking the cue from the teacher, they all agreed. At the end of the day, when all the other children had left, Teddy lingered behind. And he came over to the desk and he said, Miss Thompson... Miss Thompson, all day today, you smelled just like my mother used to smell. That's her bracelet you're wearing. It looks very nice on you. I'm really glad you like my present. And he, he turned and he left, and she got down on her knees. She cried her eyes out and asked God to forgive her. And on her knees, she surrendered to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The next day when they came into that classroom, they didn't come into a classroom. They came into an outpost of the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God is where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. She reached out to the children who were having trouble, especially the little Teddy. She tutored, she encouraged. By the end of the school year, Teddy had caught up with a lot of children. He was even ahead of some. The Stollard family moved away. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time, and then one day, a letter came with a simple note. Dear Miss Thompson, I'm graduating from high school. I wanted you to be the first to know. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, another note. Dear Miss Thompson, I'm second in my class. The university has not been easy, but I really liked it. I'm graduating on Saturday. Wanted you to be the first to know. Four years later, another note. Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore J. Stollard, M.D. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm, I'm getting married. The 27th of July to 
to be exact. I, I want you to come. I, I want you to sit where my mother would have sat. Would you do that? And she went. And she sat where the mother would have sat. She deserved to be there. She did what she could. Did what she could. Jesus said the kingdom begins within us. Sometimes we get so caught up with social justice issues that we forget that the hearts and the minds of people have to be transformed by Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. People have to be changed. And the way that change begins is when your prayer life changes. I don't know what your prayer life is like. I dare say most of us probably pray like my son did when he was seven years old. Came into the living room and said, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? <laughs> and you realize that his theology was such that he defined God as some kind of transcendental uh, Santa Claus. And if we said things nicely and behaved ourselves, he would give us what we asked for. Don't get me wrong, we still make our request known to God. The Bible says you have not because you ask not, but it's not to inform God. God's not waiting to be informed. Dear Lord, Sister Mary is sick in the hospital. What do you think God's saying? Whoa. <laughs> I didn't know that. Which hospital? God knows what you need before you even ask. Amen? Yeah, I mean, you don't need to inform God. You need to print this, list your needs in order to establish dependency on God, not to inform God. But it's the Spirit that moves you and directs you. But as you get cleansed, as you allow Jesus to reach across time and space and connect with you and absorb out of you the dark things in your humanity, that Spirit is released and it explodes inside of you. And Jesus says this, and it shall be in you like a fountain of living water. Whoa! Exploding, flowing out of you. One morning I got up and I was exhilarated. I was really alive in the Holy Spirit. I, I, said, I, I said, this doesn't happen every day, but this particular day, it was, man, I was vibrant. I got on an airplane to fly to Chicago for a speaking engagement. And I got there late and they gave me a middle seat. And there were fat guys on either side of me. And they had already grabbed the armrests. And it was a hot summer day, and they were wearing T-shirts, and I was wearing a polo shirt, and I had these fat, flabby arms squeezed against mine. And the guy next to me was upset. I looked over. I could feel the tension in his arms. There were beads of perspiration on his brow. I knew I should say something, and being good evangelistic people like you are, you probably would have said, excuse me, sir, you look troubled. You need the four spiritual laws. <laughs> you probably would have had him saved and sanctified before the plane landed in Chicago. I'm not very good at that, but I did the next best thing. I felt the energy of God within me. I didn't say anything. I just leaned on him. <laughs> and I let the power flow. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, Campolo, you're talking about the Holy Spirit as though it's some kind of energy force that flows into you and can flow out of you to other people. That's it, man. You say, I don't get it. Then you don't get Jesus walking down a dusty road and a diseased woman reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. Do you remember this story? And he stops and he says, who touched me? I felt power go out of me. You say, yes, but that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's not. And here's what it says in the eighth chapter of Roman. Check it out. And the same power that was in Christ Jesus and raised him from the dead, that same power power shall be in your mortal bodies. So I let him have it all the way to Chicago. <laughs> and when the plane touched down, I said, Lord, if you want me to talk to this guy, you're going to have to give me a sign. Now, there's a stupid theology, <laughs> a sign. I don't know what I was expecting. The flight attendant turning into an armadillo. I want a <laughs> sign. <laughs> no sooner had I said that than this guy turned to me. He said, Mr. I'm in deep trouble. I need God. I was hoping for something more specific. 
we went into the cafeteria at O'Hare, and over the next half hour, I led him into a personal relationship with Jesus. But hear me, people. <laughs> hear me. It's not because I came, quoting the Apostle Paul, with excellent words, but because I came to him in the power of the Holy Spirit. You can have all the right words, or as Scripture says, you can have all the forms of godliness and not have that power. Oh, how we need that power that comes, that comes in prayer. You know, it's okay to pray publicly. I, I, we have to do it. It has its reward. But if you really want to pray, says Jesus, read the Sermon on the Mount. Go into a closet. Go into a room all by yourself. Close the door, and here's what it says. And the God you meet in secret will reward you openly. And when that happens, you become an instrument for God for changing the world. You become somebody who works for the poor. You become somebody who's empowered to evangelize. You become somebody through whom God can make a difference in this world. You become one of those good seeds that God plants in the world to help build his kingdom. Do you want to become a kingdom maker? Do you want to become an instrument of God through whom he can change things in your home, in your family, in your community, in your school, in the place where you work? Do you want to become an instrument of his love in the world? That's the invitation. When this service is over, I'm going to ask people who are ready to make that commitment to come down the aisle. There'll be people here in the front who will pray with you because you do need prayerful support. There's an invitation there. Do you need cleansing? Do you need the Holy Spirit to come alive in your life? Do you want to become somebody through whom God can do kingdom work in the world so that the kingdoms of this world can be changed through you? And the good work, I'm quoting from Philippians, the first chapter, the good work that he begins in you, he will complete on the day of his coming. And he is coming. So I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to ask them to play 20 verses of Just As I Am. I've been there. You know, you've been there too, haven't you? 20 verses of Just As I Am. People come down just as they are and go out just as they were. You know, I mean, <laughs> we've got to do better than that. We've got to come and surrender to Christ. Then the world will change. The world will change. You've been a good group of people to talk to considering you're predominantly white. I see a few non-white faces out there, but you're rare. And white people are hard to talk to. You can say anything to white people. I just returned from the moon. In my church, you know how you're doing. Even when you're not doing well, they let you know. One time I was halfway through a sermon that was going nowhere. Every preacher has that feeling. I'm doing my best, but nothing's happening. And some lady in the back yelled, Help him, Jesus! Help him, Jesus! And I, I, I knew it wasn't going well. Likewise, in my church, when you're pumping on all cylinders, they let you know. The deacons sit right up on the front row, and whenever you say something good, they yell, Preach, brother! Preach! Preach! Jeez. You really feel like preaching. You got 20 guys yelling, Preach at you. And the women in my church, they put one hand in the air like this, and they go, Well, just like that, well... So that doesn't sound like much. You get 500 women giving you, well, your hormones bubble. And the men in my church, they are actually the best. They actually stand up and start pointing at you and yelling at you and yelling, keep going, my man, keep going, baby, keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't get that from white people. <laughs> white people do not yell, keep going, keep going. They yell, stop, stop. <laughs> It was my turn to preach. You say, what do you mean your turn? Once a year in our church, we have a preach-off. You don't even know what they are here at Mars Hill. <laughs> you get about seven preachers, eight preachers, and we preach back to back to see who's best. Nobody says that, but we know what it's about. <laughs> and it was my turn. I don't want to brag, people. I do not want to brag. I was good. I knew I was good because the deacons were yelling preach and women were doing the well thing and, and men were standing up screaming at me, keep going, Tony, keep going, baby, keep going. I feed on that stuff. 
The more they did it, the better I got, the better I got, the more I did it. I, I kept getting better and better. And people, I got so good, I wanted to take notes on me. And when I finished, that place exploded. They were shouting and screaming and cheering. I sat down. My pastor hit my knee. He said, you did all right. You did all right. I said, Pastor, you're next. Are you going to be able to top that? He said, son, sit back. Because the old man, he's going to do you in. I didn't think he could that day. But that sucker got up, and for the next... Three quarters of an hour, he did me in with one lousy line over and over again. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Doesn't sound like much, but you weren't there. It was Friday. It was Friday, and my, my Jesus was dead on the cross, but that's because it was Friday. Sunday's coming. Friday. Friday, people are saying, as things have been, so they shall be. You cannot change anything in this world. But they didn't know it was only Friday. Friday, Sunday's coming. You're getting there. I think we're going to de-honkatize this crowd. So I'll give you another try. It's Friday, and they're saying a group of people in a, in a lousy-looking room in, 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 in Granville, uh, uh, Michigan, they, they can't make a difference in this world. They can't become the instrument through which God changes things in this world. But they don't know it's only Friday. <laughs> Sunday's coming. <laughs> Friday. And it looks like Al-Qaeda and ISIS is going to take over the world. They seem to be on the move and nothing can stop them. But I'm here to give you the good news, people. It's only Friday. It's Friday and Sunday's coming. He went on like that for an hour. And he kept on gooing it over and over again. Friday, Sunday's coming. Friday. When he came to the end of that message, I was exhausted. And he just yelled at the top of his lungs, Friday! And without hesitation, that whole congregation yelled back, That's the good news, people. That's the good news of the gospel. The weeds are growing, but so is the wheat. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah.